Okay, so now we're gonna talk about hearing as well as how does the ears work for balance. And so the first thing you need to realize is these are actually mechanical receptors. You might not think of it that way. When you think about hearing, you think of it as something you know, outside of the idea of it being a mechanical receptor because you're hearing something. When you think of mechanical stuff, you usually think of movements and stuff like that. So you may not realize that actually what you're doing when you're hearing is you're listening to air pressure changes. Um, when you talk or when you, and you feel this more from a stereo or a helicopter or something, you might've felt that or a, something else pushing against you, you hear that boom, 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 sound like when the helicopter's flying. It's more obvious the air pressure or when somebody sings with high pitch, they can actually make a glass break because they're actually vibrating the glass. So it's air pressure that's actually pushing against your eardrum that ultimately is moving fluids around that bend hair cells that then of course turn into action potentials and all sorts of stuff that help you to hear. And so it is actually a mechanical receptor. And this is also a type of signal transduction, taking mechanical stimuli and turning it into um, cellular chemical process that allows you to interpret the environment as an animal. So animals can hear sound. Some of it's due to ears. Some of it is through bone conduction. If they're, if they're walking on land, they can feel vibrations through their legs. Uh, grasshoppers might have little pads on their legs that move to sound. So sound is, you know, quite um, as a mechanical thing air vibrations, but it's also vibrations that occur in water as well. So let's talk about the ear. And again, we're gonna look at human ears kind of a model, but then again, you can use this basic model to explain hearing in vertebrates in particular. And if we were talking about insects, there'd be some kind of similarities, but they're not gonna have a, a cochlea for instance, but they're gonna have hair cells and things that move. Bone conduction is a little different. Obviously, they're feeling vibrations through their bone. And you probably recognize that too. If you tap your head, you feel a different kind of sound that's vibrating differently than what the actual sound of the tap would make. So here's our ear. And again, the different animals would have different types of outer coverings. And we'll get into how and why at least at some level, how other animals can hear different pitches. And so here we have um, obviously the outside of the ear and the external portion of the ear, and then we have the internal portion of the ear, and then we have a middle ear. And so we're gonna get into what all these different parts do. Um, here's our ear ground, for instance, and then we have the three bones of the middle ear, and they hook up with the cochlea. The cochlea is actually part of the skull that's tubular, looks kind of snail shaped in this picture. Um, this is where the hearing takes place. And then you have a vestibular um, apparatus along with semicircular canals, a vestibule that um, allows you to have, you know, have equilibrium when it comes to um, movement and knowing where up and down is and so forth. Your ears intimately involved with helping you to have spatial orientation. So here's another picture of it. Here's our external ear. We have the pinna. This is obviously an air-filled tube because this is your outside of your ear. So if you get an external ear infection, this is where it happens. If you get outer ear infection or swimmer's ear, there's this is where it occurs and then you get uh, water and bacteria growth or whatever, possibly your fungal. Um, the skin in this area is very thin. So when you do use a Q-tip, you're trying, you can rub this skin and cause abrasions that increases your likelihood of ear infections. You can also accidentally jab your ear with a Q-tip and, and harm your eardrum. So again, I would say great care should be used when using a Q-tip. Uh, sometimes you can use an acidic acid or 
rubbing alcohol to help dry out your ear occasionally if you're swimming to help avoid an outer ear infection. Now, middle ear infection is a different kind of story. Usually you're taking an antibiotic directly um, or inner ear infection is even much more dangerous where you can run into true deafness um, if you get a bacterial infection in here. Um, you'll see there's all sorts of nerves associated with these different portions. These are the smallest bones of the body, by the way, the bones of the middle ear. And then here we have a tube that's going to the pharynx. Um, the eustachian tube, as I think is how it's pronounced, is why your ears pop when you go to different altitudes. So when your, your ears reach equilibrium because you're going up or down in elevation, you yawn, whatever, or chew gum when you're in an airplane, and you'll help to relieve the air pressure differences between the middle ear and the outside air through this tube. And so that's where you hear your ears popping is through this. Um, in babies, this is actually a pretty flat tube. And so sometimes if a baby's laid down too much when it's nursing or feeding, you can get some milk build up in here and cause some um, infection. So it's better to keep the baby's head tilted up when you're feeding it. Um, the three bones of the middle, uh, middle ear are the malus, or also known as the hammer. The incus, which is the middle one, or the anvil. And the last one is the stirrup or stapes, which is actually connects with an oval window. So it basically goes from the eardrum, the hammer, and then it goes to the stirrup down here in this oval window. And so actually movement by these bones pushes on the vestibule or the oval window and helps to move fluids that are found inside of this ear. That includes things like endolymph. It's kind of a saline solution or, and it's also, you can find paralymph in the vestibule apparatus and oval windows, which is where we get the equilibrium. Um, the vibrations, as you'll, you'll see, when I talk about vibrations, I remember air, and you'll see this in another picture, but airwaves are pushing against this eardrum. So when you hear sounds, it's pushing against your eardrum, moving these three little bones, moving this oval window, and then ultimately moving fluids that are found in the cochlea. This, of course, makes more sense once you see some more pictures and, of course, an animation. You'll you understand a little bit about hearing when you mess with a tuning fork. You hit it, and you'll watch the tuning fork vibrate in it, and you'll hear the sounds that come from it. Um, and you can see it's basically areas of compressed area and areas without compression. So that means you don't hear in space because there is an air compression in outer space. So you know, watching an explosion in outer space doesn't happen. You can't hear it simply because there, it's in a vacuum and there's no airwaves to make these compressions. When we talk about hearing, we talk about things like frequency and amplitude. Frequency would refer to the pitch of the sound. So high pitch frequencies have a high frequency. The, the vibration rate is high, irrespective of the amplitude, the loudness and intensity of the sound. So low pitch sounds have lower frequencies. High pitch sounds have higher frequencies. Obviously, some animals can hear high frequency sounds better than you can, like dogs and cats and, and rodents and so forth. And then some animals can hear low frequency sounds better than you can, like elephants and whales and stuff like that. So hearing is basically sound transduction, and it does so through hair cells. And so this is one of the uh, more useful slides that I want you to learn. Um, this is kind of walks you through the mechanisms of hearing. So you can see the air waves are coming in and they bounce against the eardrum. eardrum. 
And in doing so, it moves the vibrations through the malice, the incas, the stapes, and then pushes against the oval window that ultimately pushes on these fluids um, that are found inside the cochlea. This, there's actually three different chambers in the cochlea, and here's being, normally it's all nice and coiled up. It's actually made up of the skull shape, is actually, actually skull bone making that shape. But when you round it out, it makes it a little easier to visualize. And what you'll see is that the outer portion has a fluid in it called paralymph. And again, it's kind of a salty saline solution. I don't know if, how much different it is than endolymph, but it is a bit different solution. And then inside um, this cochlear duct is endolymph, which I think may be a little saltier, I would imagine, because this is where the hair cells are, are at and where the action takes place for starting to depol, here we go again, depolarizing hair cells and, and so forth. And you'll understand that in, in the next couple of diagrams and pictures. So the state piece is attached to the membrane. And again, that's pushing against this oval window. So that's where the membrane is. And again, it causes fluids to go through the paralymph. So again, it's kind of like dropping a pebble into water and you watch the vibrations go through it. When the stapes pushes against the oval window, vibrations are put into the fluids, into the water. So you can see how this is a mechanical receptor. This is a mechanical force going on it. The energy um, waves transfer across the cochlear duct into the tympanic duct. And so here we have the, um, vestibular duct, and then the waves come back down the tympanic duct, or actually they go through the cochlear duct into the tympanic duct, and then back out the round window. Well, I do think they go round, but they also push against. And so what's happening is um, the vibrations probably are pretty, and the waves are pretty heavy, and then they get diluted, and then ultimately they kind of get lost back in to this air through this round window. So it's kind of like um, stopping the vibration because it, instead of having an echo chamber where these waves, when they bounce against the cochlear duct, they don't bounce back into the parallel and back and forth. They kind of dissipate out the round window. So you don't have the echo effect that would happen like you normally do when you have sounds hit a wall, you'll hear echo, 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 especially in canyons and stuff like that. Well, think of it, if you can visualize this is like a canyon, basically these sound waves are dissipating out so it doesn't have that echo effect. Um, so that's where, it, so like that's what it says right here on number five, it dissipates back into the middle ear. So what's not really seen in this picture in the, in the cochlear duct is a bunch of hair cells that are called the organ of cordy that will actually bend in relationship to those um, sound waves going through the paralymph. There's also a tympanic membrane that you'll see in the moment. Although there's a tympanic membrane here, but... Um, Let me show you one other thing, which is the eardrum. I want to see if I can find it. Oh, that's a tectorial membrane. So here's the tympanic membrane. And inside the cochlear duct, so we're going to go zoom in right here, inside the cochlear duct. So we're zooming in to the cochlear duct. You'll see how it's kind of so look at this right here. We've got the, um, the cochlear duct, and then we're going to zoom in, like magnify in. And you can see this little area right here is what we call the organ of cordy. And it has a tectorial membrane. And underneath it are these hair cells. These are the specialized hair cells that can pick up on the vibration. And notice what's closely associated with the hair cells. 
via a synapse, well, we have our nerve endings that are part of it. They're cochlear nerves or sensory nerves. Uh, they look like, appear in this picture, they clearly don't have a um, myelin sheath or anything like that. So they're going a short distance. And so if you look at this picture here, you can see the organ of Cordy, and then you can see all the nerves coming off of it. See the nerves coming off of it? Those are the cochlear nerves, and they transmit action potentials from the hair cells to the auditory cortex. So remember, the auditory cortex is in the brain. So that's where we have the auditory cortex. So if you look, again, walking through this, here's our cochlea. It's all kind of coiled up like a snail. It's part of your skull. It has three um, components to it. Here we have it stretched out so it's easier to visualize, but we have basically the oval window where the stay piece is pushing against it. We have our uh, paralymph in here and this vestibular duct. And then sitting in the middle is the cochlear duct. There's a basal, or, yeah, there's a basilar membrane that it's sitting on. And inside here we have our organ of cordy, and then on top of it is the tectorial membranes. So the base of the membranes down here. And so the fluids will travel through the top, bounce against the organ or the cochlear duct. That will push on the tectorial membrane, pushing against the hair cells. And then some of that will then just be dissipated into the tympanic duct and then out the round window. So in this picture, you can see the round, the fluid waves pushing against the tectorial membrane, again, via pushing against this membrane here in the vestibular duct. And then you can see the hair cells are bending. And as they bend, they um, depolarize or hyperpolarize and release or not release neurotransmitters. And you'll see that in the next couple of slides. So here is another viewpoint. So we just did another cross section because that's what we're, that's we're just cutting it flat and looking at it. Here you can see um, the, you know, the vestibular membrane. This is the vestibular duct then. This is the organ of Cordy right here. This is the cochlear duct, which will have endolymph. And then down here would be the um, this, um, I was going to say the vestibular duct. Let me just double check. So we have the vestibular duct, the tympanic duct. So we'll have the tympanic duct down here. So the vestibular duct, the organ of Cordy, and the um, tympanic. I can look at a tympanic duct. And so here you can see the organ of Cordy. See how these are the specialized hair cells. And then the hairs are sitting right on top. They're just like literally just laying right next to the tectorial membrane. And so when the sound waves push against the vestibular membrane and push on that tectorial membrane, it'll bend the hair cells. And then they will depolarize, releasing neurotransmitters that will hook up with this cochlear nerve and then travel to the brain. So here's another picture of the organ of Cordy. Remember there's basilar membranes down here, the tectorial membranes here. And then if you remember the eardrum is the tectorial or tympanic membrane, excuse me. So here's the tectorial membrane. And so this is the fluids that are going through the vestibular duct, which is on top. And when they go through, they're pushing on the, the cochlear duct, which pushes down on the tectorial membrane, bending the hair cells. And then in the next picture, you'll see how that helps to polarize the hair cells. 
the the vibe the sounds as they're pushing against that dissipate into the tympanic duct and out the round window, which isn't shown in that picture. So I mean, if you if you imagine going back through this, you can kind of see what was going on. So the organ cordy and the is being pushed here and the hair cells are bending. And that's what's being shown in here. And so this is what's happening to the hair cells um, that are found in the organ of Cordy, the tectorial membranes on top. And so at rest, they're kind of sitting, you know, imagine my fingers is like the little hairs on that hair cell. They're sitting up nicely. And then when the vibrations come through, the hair cells bend. And if they are excited, they actually will bend in such a way that it's almost like spreading the fingers open. It'll pull on proteins that open up channels that allow for depolarization, presumably sodium's flowing in. But that might need to be double checked if you're interested in knowing for certain what, it, what ion is making it more positive. I presume it's sodium. And so when sodium flows in, the inside becomes more positive and depolarizes. So it's like a generator or graded potential like we had in the cell body from the previous lectures. And when it increases inside, presumably calcium comes in and we have um, exocytosis of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters go across the synapse, triggering action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. And so at rest, we have a few neurotransmitters that are tonically coming out. During excitation, we have, because the hair cells are bending due to the sound waves coming through as ripples, we have increased action potentials. And that's what you see here. Look at this membrane potential. At normal rest or whatever, or normal conditions where um, it says at rest, 10% of the ion channels are open and we have a membrane potential around negative 30 millivolts. Under excitation, we get up to around negative 10 millivolts, as best I can read it, or negative five millivolts. And then during inhibition, perhaps when it's even quieter or whatever, the hair cells go in the opposite direction, closing, and we don't even have, we have less neurotransmitters being released. And I don't know if it's zero, like it's shown in this picture, but it's less than 10%. And then down here, it shows you what's happening with the action potentials. At rest, we have a few action potentials going through, in quotes, a few. When it's excited, we have lots of action potentials going through. And when it is um, quiet, we have even fewer, fewer action potentials going, going through. And remember, it's the frequency of action potentials that represents magnitude. And you can imagine sound waves, what happens for hair cells, they can be damaged when loud sound waves come through and push big drop, you know, big um, vibrations in those fluids. Those can bend the hair cells and damage them and break them. So that's how you get hearing damage via loud sounds. The basilar membrane does play an important role in pitch and sound. So the front of the, so this is again, the organ of Cordy kind of stretched out. And so you can see that the basilar membrane is laying on the bottom and the front part of it is stiff, high frequency vibrations. And then the bottom part is flat for low frequency vibrations. And so as the sound waves push against the tympanic membrane, if it's a high pitched sound, meaning um, you know, very loud, or not loud sound, but very 
high pitch, you know, you know what I'm talking about, high frequency sounds. So it's, you know, it's, and I don't want to do a falsetto for you, but you get the gist. Um, that front part of the ear, those are where you're going to see more of the vibrations and hair cells responding to, while low pitch sounds cause um, these hair cells to bend. Now, animals that can hear really high pitched sounds probably have differences in their basilar membrane that allow for that, while animals that can hear really low pitched sounds have even more flexible basilar membranes. So that's how some of that occurs. Now let's watch a little animation on how sound works or, or how sound transduction works and hearing works. All right, so here is some hearing. This is an an Organ. animation. Our ears. Here. To understand the ear, we need to understand what sound is. The speakers you are listening to right now are vibrating, flexing in and out, causing a wave of pressure through the air. The frequency of these waves, or the speed at which the sound creating surface moves back and forth, affects the pitch of the sound. So here we got again our dense air, con air con that's been condensed and air that is spread out. Um, that is what we refer to when we talk about sound. Now let's talk about our ear. Also emphasize the frequencies used in human speech. Now that the sound waves are caught. So here's our outer ear, here's our tympanic membrane, here's our ear bones. And then you can see that here's the cochlear duct and up here is the vestibular apparatus and semicircular canals. They travel through the ear canal and strike against our eardrum, a thin membrane about 10 millimeters wide. So you can see how the sound waves are coming in and pushing against the tympanic membrane and it's pushing against those ear bones, ultimately pushing on the oval window. And what they show you here is there's a big difference in size. So this is amplification. And now let's see what's happening in organ accordion. Hearing. The cochlea. The cochlea. In reality, it is coiled up, but it is easier to understand straightened out. There are actually three chambers inside but let's take a look at the central part. The stapes is causing pressure waves to travel through the structure. Along the inside wall is about 20 to 30,000 reed-like fibers. As the waves move along, they encounter fibers with the correct resonant frequency and energy is released. These fibers aren't actually what give us... Some of this is related to the basilar membrane. I believe that's what he's referring it's to. It's a signal that we heard something. There is a special structure next to these fibers containing hair cells. When the fibers resonate, they cause the hair cells to move, which then sends an electrical impulse to the cochlear nerve and onto the brain. Certain pitches of sound will resonate in specific locations, and louder sounds will cause more hair cells to move. Let's see if we can find another animation that would help. So you got some idea from that picture. Let's wonder if we got another one that can help us. I'll we'll pause it for a second. All right, so here's a little bit of animation that's kind of cool. Auditory transduction. The ear converts sound waves in the air into electrical impulses, which can be interpreted by the brain. As sound enters the ear, it passes through the external auditory canal where it meets the tympanic membrane. So here's a tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then vibrates in response to the sound. Watch how it vibrates sound. the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch or frequency produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume or amplitude produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher stapes. So you see how sound waves and the loudness has an effect. 
The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, vibrating, passing on the information of frequency and amplitude. A tympany nerve and are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympany nerve and the tendon of the vestibuli. So let's talk about the organ, the vent, you know, the organ of course. The descending portion of the, the passage uh, is called the scala tympany. Here's the tubes, fluid filled. Remember the A third structure tone. called the cochlear duct is situated between the scala vestibuli the and the scala tympany. Duct. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross-section, so the, the membranes separating the two fluid-filled systems are visible. Paralymph in this They are somewhere. Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. So if you didn't catch that, the basilar membrane's down here. And this would be the vestibular, I believe. They are Reissner's membrane. We call it a different name. And the basilar membrane. And here's the tectorial membrane. And then the, the membranes are cordy. flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale. Yeah, the tectorial vestibular. membrane's moving, and the hair cells will be right The movements here. of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale. And then dissipates. So cells come in and dissipate. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated, and then which sends nerve, nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. When I say fire, I always talk about nerve impulse depolarization. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of Here's corti hair called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. So here's our hair cells with tectorial membranes, and down here, are the sensory nerves. As the basilar mm -hmm. membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. Or not fire, depending on what direction. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of so remember, the stiffer area will be the high pitch, and the looser area will be the low pitch, as I mentioned earlier about the basilar membrane. Sound. So more of a bass. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea, whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer. So I think that's a pretty cool little animation of what's going on. Okay, now we're going to talk about how the ears are involved as a equilibrium. And this is specifically found in the vestibular apparatus. Here we're going to find hair cells again. Some of them are going to be associated with autolyphs, which are like little stones of calcium on a gelatin that can detect gravity and bend the hair cells or not, and cause um, obviously action potentials and all sorts of things that go to the brain that will then integrate and use that information to determine which way is up and down. We also have some semicircular canals that are fluid filled. And when the fluids move, they will push against the hair cells in a way that bend the hair cells and either st stimulate neurotransmitters to be released and action potentials or not. And that will give us our dynamic equilibrium. So this is pretty cool. So, so let's look at the ears. Here is the ears and we have our semicircular canals. We have our superior canal our posterior canal and our horizontal canal. And then each one of these areas in this vestibular apparatus is these um, ampules that have hair cells associated with a gelatin. 
that can move in relationship to the fluids, bending the hair cells in, re in regards to the fluids. <clears throat> and then we have in the bigger part of the apparatus, the saccula and the macula. And this is hair cells that have the autolifts associated with it that can pull in relationship to gravity. So you'll notice that these semicircular canals go in different directions. Some are like the superior kind of head over heels. So if you flipped over head over heels, it would detect that kind of movement. Posterior picks up on this kind of movement and semicircular kind of moves in a different direction. So again, posterior and uh, superior is like nodding yes and no. Posteriors um, kind of right and left and horizontal when you're shaking your head no. So it's picking up on those fluids. It's obviously they're moving, those other fluids are still moving too in relationship to whatever direction your head's tilting or your body's tilting. But again, it's relationship mostly to how your head's tilting. And so um, the fluids are moving around. And as you probably have seen when you're spinning yourself as a little kid or you're into ice skating, you're spinning around really rapidly. When you stop, the world keeps spinning. That's because those fluids are still moving inside those canals, pushing at the hair cells until they stop. So that is what we talk about or refer to when we talk about dynamic equilibrium. The endolips are pushing against this gelatin substance called cupula, bending the hair cells. And a lot like what we've seen for hearing, the hair cells when they bend will either um, have a release of neurotransmitters by via depolarization and calcium coming in and sodium channels opening up and all that kind of stuff just like we've said so many different times now. And then those neurotransmitters will be released going to the nerve fibers, depolarizing the nerve fibers and sending a signal to the brain. Or if they're pushed the other direction, then they are hyperpolarized, those hair cells, releasing fewer neurotransmitters and that tells the brain something else, that you're not moving or you're moving in the opposite direction. And that's what we're talking about in dynamic equilibrium. So you can see the hair cells are pushing in relationship to the fluids. So the fluids are moving one direction, the bristles are moving in the opposite. So it can either hyperpolarize the hair cell or, or polarize the, or depolarize the hair cells, ultimately causing the release of neurotransmitters down these nerve fibers. Whether it's the nerves are firing or not, both is providing information to the brain. And then here's the vestibular apparatus in regards to the maculas. And you can see it's, it's a gelatin matrix with autolifts on top. And when those autolifts bend the gelatin, the hair cells bend. And when they bend, it tells us where gravity is. So that's the gist of it. So here you can see the autolifts are bending. So if I'm bending my head back and just in static equilibrium, the hair cells are bending backwards in, in those parts of my ear, telling me my head's leaning back or forward, and I can tell gravity's this way. Again, it's the, the hair cells are bending because the gelatin is bending in relationship to these crystals called autolifts. They're like little stones, likely made up of calcium and things like that. So that is, static equilibrium. So dynamic is when they're, they're moving around the fluids and static is when you're not moving, but you can still detect up and down. You can close your eyes and you know, for the most part, which way is up or down. Here's the head nodding and the autolus bending the gelatin. And again, what happens when the autolus bend the hair cells and spread them apart? Sodium comes in, depolarizes the hair cells. Calcium comes in, causes exocytosis and neurotransmitters to be released in the synapse and action potentials and sodium coming in or whatever to cause the depolarization of the nerve cells. And then it goes to the 
parts of your brain that are responsible for equilibrium. And I believe that would be um, probably the, mid, um, not the medulla, but the, the back part of your brain. If we go back to the very front slides, we're gonna take a look at the brain real quick. It would be the cerebellum. See how? So here's sound, sounds going to the auditory cortex and then the semicircular canals are going to the cerebellum. Oh, there's eyes, that'll be the next lecture. So that pretty much, let's see if we can find a little uh, present, anything on, um, oh, here's, here's the, uh, brain here obviously this is our cerebral cortex or thalamus here's our medulla and here's our cerebellum so cerebellum is actually a very primitive part of the brain that's imp important for hearing and equilibrium well mostly for equilibrium obviously there's going to have an auditory cortex as well and you see how all those nerves are coming in towards the cerebellum going through the medulla we're going to use, we'll do vision for the next lecture. Let's see if we can find something real quick animation. So here's our canals, semicircular, posterior, superior, lateral. The canal is responsible for sensing a particular head direction. Each semicircular canal is filled with fluid and when displacement of this fluid occurs within the canal, nerve signals are sent to the brain informing which direction the head just turned. The posterior semicircular canal shown here detects when the head tilts down this towards the shoulder. This is dynamic equilibrium. The superior semicircular canal detects when the head nods up and yeah, down in a yes motion. The lateral source of the dizziness is the dix Halpeck maneuver shown here. The head is turned 45 degrees and the body laid back such that the head is extended about 20 to 30 degrees. If the right inner ear is causing a person's dizziness, eye twitching called nystagmus will occur, a condition called BPPV. Depending on how the eye... Didn't see a whole lot more that I wanted to get out of that particular one other than it starts telling you more of a medical application, which obviously some of you may be interested in. Let's see if we can see any more regards to the... Sensation of angular movements of the head is the cristae ampullaris. Okay, this when is more helpful, I think. Each of the ducts has a widened space called an ampulla, where it connects with the utricle. Within the ampulla is a sensory organ, the cristae ampullaris. When That's one thing I didn't mention, the Christi, Christia ampullaris. Again, those are going to be found in those semicircular canals. And it's again, it's this gelatin of the hair cells and the fluids will push against it. It pushes the gelatinous cupula that covers the Christi ampullaris, causing embedded hair cells to bend and send nerve impulses to the brain. So this is a cool picture. Here's our hair cells and obviously if they bend. This, this cell will depolarize, meaning it'll become more positive. It'll be like a graded potential. And then that'll cause the release of neurotransmitters with calcium coming in or whatever to cause the exocytosis to take place. Obviously, this big round ball here is the nucleus. Now we will examine the relative motion of endolymph to that of basic movements of the head to increase clarity of inertia. You got the gist of the fluids moving through the ears. You can, should watch more of these if they help you to understand it. But I think you got the gist of what I want you to get from this animation. Central part of the body sense of movement. But they didn't really get into the, the, the static equilibrium, which is kind of shown in this picture here. That's per hour in five seconds. Anyway, and you're actually now. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do, of course, is write a half a page summary of what you learned. 
a little bit more than half page or whatever. And then I would like you to, um, well, you're gonna have to learn how to draw this and explain how hearing works. Um, so use slide 45 and slide 49. So slide 45 and slide 49, I'd like for you to draw and explain what's going on. So I'm not even worried as much about the half page. Do it, definitely write a paragraph or two, but I want you to do slide 45 and slide 49. And again, you don't have to go crazy with writing all the details, right? You need to be able to explain what's going on though and diagram. You'll see these questions on the next exam and you'll probably be able to if you do a good job, you can probably add portions of this to your take home exam. So it does help you just to do it. Obviously doing it more would be good. Being able to verbally explain it and your, have your oral exam will be very good. So I hope this, I think this was one of the more fun lectures if you don't were familiar with how hearing works or equilibrium. So I think this was pretty fun. So anyway, um, we will be moving on to vision for our next lecture. Thank you.